Welcome to the Bear Marriage Podcast. I'm Sheila Ray Gregoire from BearMarriage.com, where we like to talk about healthy, evidence-based biblical advice for your sex life and your marriage. And I am joined today by my daughter, Rebecca Lindenbach. Hello. And coming up, we have an amazing interview with Wendy Snyder from Fresh Start Families. We're so excited about that. Um, one of the most common questions that we get is uh, about how to parent in an emotionally healthy way, because we talk so much about emotionally healthy relationships and marriage, and that naturally translates into how do I raise my kids in an emotionally healthy way so that they can grow up feeling good about themselves, able to have good relationships, able to feel confident in Christ and all of those things. So we've got that coming up with Wendy, along with a really special webinar that we're going to um, announce then. But before we get to that, two quick things. Mm -hmm. Okay, first of all, I owe Greg Locke an apology. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So last week on the podcast, um, we made mention of the fact that Pastor Greg Locke had um, attacked a Barbie house with a baseball bat surrounded by Bibles. And it turns out it wasn't a Barbie house. It was just a regular doll a house regular that doll he house. attacked with a baseball bat that he had tied a Bible to. Yes. So it was not about the Barbie movie per se. Um, still some issues with that sermon that he gave, but not still about the Barbie movie. Still lots of issues with literally using the Bible as a battering ram. Yes, for a dollhouse, but not about the Barbie movie. Nope, not but Barbie. speaking about issues, <laughs> <laughs> while speaking, um, we have, we've been trying to work on a policy. And I just thought that it would be really good to share that with you all today. Because one of the things that's, that's starting to happen now that COVID is over is that I'm getting asked to speak a lot. Mm -hmm. and, and something that's been happening the whole time is we've been on podcasts and other people's platforms quite yes. a bit promoting the book. And uh, what we get asked a lot is, uh, you know, why are you going on this podcast or that podcast? Because they clearly disagree with everything that we stand for. <laughs> right. And so I thought I would just share what our policy is so that you know you can hear our hearts because this is something that we wrestle with a lot as mm -hmm. a team behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So um, I think our, our number one goal is to speak to people who really need to hear. You know, just like Jesus went wherever he was asked to speak. You know, he went um, and sat at the Pharisees' houses. He went and mm -hmm. talked to tax collectors and sinners. Like, he didn't only hang out with people who totally agreed with him. Yeah. He went and talked to people who really needed the message and who were willing to listen. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the big thing. And he didn't mm -hmm. compromise his values when he went and talked to those people. Right, right. And so what, what we're trying to figure out is, so where where will I speak if I'm asked to speak or if you're asked to speak? Yeah, Becca, realistically, or... it's going to be you. But <laughs> <laughs> you're the yeah. one with toddlers, yeah. But, um, and so, and so we, do, we do have a couple of guidelines. First of all, if I am ever hosting an event or if I'm having people on the podcast, I will only ever have people that I have vetted as much as I can vet. Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes you have someone on and you realize afterwards, oh, there were issues with that person that you didn't know beforehand. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's a difficult situation. But as much as possible, I will only have people on that I have vetted. And or, that or or specifically the portion of their their writing or their video or whatever they do, the part that we are talking about, we vetted. Right. Right. Exactly. So like if they've written 17 books and we're talking about one of them, we vetted that book. Yes. And we haven't and vetted the other 16. As much as we know, there's like not abuse allegations. Yeah, or as exactly. As much as we know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so this is not a person who is going to, you know, share teachings that might be harmful or that might cover up or enable abuse. This doesn't mean that we agree with them 100%. In fact, yeah. We probably don't. Agree I mean, with even just the fact that we're Canadians and mostly have Americans on, we don't agree with anyone right. 100%. I, I don't agree with you 100%. No, no. You don't agree with me 100%. So it doesn't mean that I stand by everything they say, but I, but I will endeavor as much as possible to not invite people to speak that I think are harmful. At the same time, I will go and speak mm -hmm. at places that I think are harmful if they'll have me. <laughs> yeah, because well, why wouldn't we? I mean, everyone who's here, who's listening, the vast majority of people here were in churches that restrict mm -hmm. women, that uh, are all about us versus them, that are about maintaining power over others, that are actively harmful. And the reason that they left was because someone went into that space mm -hmm. and said, maybe it's maybe it could be different. And I think that there's there's so much need to, in essence, have, and I, I know this is a, a loaded term outside of evangelicalism, but mm -hmm. like within evangelicalism, I actually think it works, missionaries yes. into, <laughs> yes. into a lot of these spaces, because 
what often happens is you get so insulated and you get into an echo chamber and mm-hmm. our whole mantra forever has been let's change the evangelical conversation about sex about all this mm-hmm. different stuff and you can't change the conversation if you're only speaking to people who already agree with you yeah or There's, if you're not part of the bigger conversation that's going yeah, on yeah exactly mm-hmm. and there are so many people whose job is to speak to those who are already through it and mm-hmm. we do that quite a bit too a lot of people mm-hmm. are here for that but one of the one of the things that we do that other people don't is we actually are often people's first point of contact and that's kind of how I hope people can see us too we're the first point of contact for a lot of people Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. they start to listen to us and then they 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 get to uh, find a new community that actually you know accepts them as they are and doesn't see them as lesser because they're a woman right so if John MacArthur asked me to speak I would speak even though it's John MacArthur (laughs) John MacArthur is never in a million years no I would speak at the gospel coalition even though we clearly think that both of them are are horrendous theology that's just terrible and destroys lives because those are the people that really need to hear and and so you know when I if if I'm asked to give a workshop at a conference that doesn't mean that I agree with all the other workshop speakers no absolutely not I I don't have time to vet them in fact like if someone were to ask me to speak at a conference and there's 25 other speakers I have no way of vetting those 25 other speakers yeah. at the point where I'm asked to speak I probably don't even know who the other 25 are no they often aren't even announced the like often the other speakers don't even yeah. find out until it's announced to the public so if I'm in, if I'm asked to speak I'm going because I want I want the people who are attending the conference to have the chance to hear our message mm-hmm. and by our I mean like our whole community you know I, I want to take our whole community and I want to bring it into the place where this conference is happening and so that doesn't mean that I necessarily endorse the other conference speakers it just means that I I am going to make sure that in my part of that conference, I am bringing our message of health and wholeness. And hopefully I can steer that conversation in a good direction. Yeah. And I think the other thing that I want to add is whenever we are speaking, whether it's on a podcast that, you know, totally disagrees with us or Mm -hmm. it's at a conference, the big thing is that we're not going to compromise our values because it makes them more comfortable. We actually have been told you can do this if you don't name names. And we're like, no, Mm -hmm. No, yeah. we're not not naming names. So either you can have us or or you can't. Mm-hmm. So we don't offer a watered down version. Right. If people who are promoting the theology that's part of the problem are willing to have the antidote present, I mean, I just feel like at some point it's, mm-hmm. it's, I don't know. I, I just, I just think that we can be so tempted to create an echo chamber Mm -hmm. Um, And it's easy to see the other side doing that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's hard to see our side doing that. Yeah. And we just want to make sure that we don't keep perpetuating the cycle where people remain in toxic theologies because they've been able to remain secluded from the rest of the world. Yeah. We want to go through and, and make sure that they get to hear there's a different way and hopefully change their thinking. Yeah. So just because I speak at a church doesn't mean I agree with that church's theology. Yeah. Just because I speak at a conference doesn't mean that I endorse all the other conference speakers. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, like there's obviously some nuance. I, I think I would have a really hard time speaking at a conference with Mark Driscoll, no matter how much I wanted to share my message. Like I've got some personal issues too, like with some of the But I think that's also why it's so, but what you're but, saying is there's personal issues for you there, right? Yeah. And I think that's actually one of the reasons why it's important that, you know, we do go into these spaces because mm-hmm. a lot of the people speaking in these spaces were directly harmed. Like they're survivors of Bethlehem mm-hmm. Church, right? Uh, of John Piper's churches. They're, yeah. they're actually active abuse survivors. And frankly, we're not. Right. We're coming at this with, with evidence, with data, mm-hmm. but it also means that um, it's easier for us mm-hmm. um, because we don't have as many of the the, the, the direct trauma responses. Yeah. And as horrible as it is, it often means that they're more likely to listen to us as well, even yeah. though none of us agree that's a good thing. So that idea of like, there's a personal thing sometimes, yeah, but we have fewer personal things, that's which right. is why it's important for us to do the work mm-hmm. because like it's, it's like what Paul says, right? Like the eye cannot say to the ear, you know, I don't need you. The ear cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Each part must do its must do its job in the body of Christ. That's a direct quote, word for word. It's not. <laughs> but the idea is that, you know, we might just be the feet going places where other people don't want to go. Mm-hmm. And you might be, you know, the heart or mm-hmm. the liver detoxifying. I don't know. Like, yeah. whatever you are, like, do your thing. Um, but just, yeah, mm-hmm. make sure, we just want to make sure that we've had a couple people like listen to podcasts that we were on and then listen to other episodes and be like, wait, this is weird. And we so we just wanted to clear this up yeah. and say, hey, just because we're somewhere doesn't mean it's, a, it's necessarily a safe place to be. Yeah. Um, so just, just follow us on Bear Marriage. Yeah. But you know what? Like maybe we're moving people. Yeah. Um, and we're, we're challenging people to think, including some of the podcast hosts. And so, yeah, in general, I'm going to say yes 
to most podcasts. Mm -hmm. Um, Obviously, there'll be exceptions. Sometimes I just don't think I have the emotional bandwidth to handle some people. And so I reserve that right as well. Yeah. And also, sometimes it's just that you've done a lot of ones that we disagree with in a row. So it's not even like this one's particularly bad. It's more just like, I've done seven of these. And and right now, (laughs) I am not doing a lot of podcasts because I am so busy writing a book, um, our marriage book, which is awesome. Um, But yeah, that that's just generally our philosophy about speaking. And so I'm going to put that up so that you guys can all see it. But that's that's what I'm hoping is that doors will open. And when doors open, if people are willing to listen and yeah. willing to let me say what I need to say and let me talk about our findings, then Cause seriously, I'm going like, to try to go. What a God thing would it be, though? Like, can you actually... Like, at this point, we're not surprised when ex-angelical groups want us to speak, right? Yeah. Like when, mm-hmm. when when people who are willing to talk about abuse in the church are letting you speak somewhere. It would be really, really astounding mm-hmm. if people who were like, there's nothing wrong in the church. Everything is good. You just need to trust Jesus more and then you'll stop being abused. If those yeah. people started wanting to have us speak, that is, mm-hmm. those are the places where, where difference can really start to happen. And we're not going to see systemic change mm-hmm. unless we start to actually fight for it yeah so anyway yeah so no more echo luck. chambers and hey if greg Locke wants me to speak i will come speak at greg Locke's <laughs> church too and so without further ado someone that we can um endorse yes and, and someone that we have Love. vetted yes. let's bring on our guest for today well we are so thrilled to bring back to the bear marriage podcast a dear friend of ours wendy snyder from fresh start families um she is a parenting coach Wendy, you did a webinar with us last year. You're doing another one with us in two weeks. We've got more information on that coming. And you were on several of our podcasts last week talking or last year talking about how to get over the punitive style of parenting and really connect with your kids. So thank you for being here. We're so excited. I'm so excited to be back. Sheila and Rebecca, thank you for having me. I love you guys. I love your community. I love what you're all about. And it really is just an honor to be here with you and to be doing this workshop together again this year. I'm pumped. Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the things that we are talking about out um, as we're going into the new school year um, and the yeah. fall is how we can help our kids do well because of how we raise them, not despite how we raise them. And sometimes the things that we're taught are good don't actually work. And yeah. it's because it's a misunderstanding of how we're supposed to parent. Um, And let me just give a bit of a background and then I'm gonna let you jump in. But in Christianity, especially, um, and I've seen this a lot, there's this idea that unless you come down hard on your kids at the very beginning, they're going to turn into little hellions and they're going to go to hell. (laughs) So we need to protect them from being little hellions. And if they go off the rails, it's your fault because you didn't come down hard enough on them. And so the emphasis is really on punishing them. And they may not say it's punished. They might say that it's disciplined, but it's, it's that control your kids. So they don't, and we had the perfect example of that with the, with a docu-series, shiny, happy people, Mm -hmm. um, a couple of months ago. So why don't we start our conversation with you? Like, what were your reactions to that docu-series? Oh my gosh, that, you know, in one way, of course, it, it did make me sick to my stomach. I'm I'm at the age now where I'm having this crazy, I have like a visceral stomach turn reaction. If I like see my kids have like a cut on their finger or something, it's hilarious. My stomach actually turns. It's like, what is happening? And, and with that documentary or that docuseries, I had that same feeling, right? Like you, you kind of feel like you want to throw up. It's it's um, heartbreaking and haunting. And I was really, really happy it came out, Sheila, because, and Rebecca, because it, it shined so much light on how we got to where we are today. And to me, it just helped explain why so many people get taken down this route, thinking that they're doing, um, you know, what they're supposed to be doing, thinking about like thinking that this is a godly way to discipline and to raise children, and how much fear and um, indoctrination was used for so many years. And uh, it just makes sense, right. And so I do think that that was one of the positive outcomes of that documentary series being aired. And I think it did stir a lot of conversation around the long-term effects of that type 
of punishment because yes, we know that it's called discipline, we'll call it discipline, but it's punishment and it's fear-based influencing tools. And, uh, and thank God there's just a really, I think there's even an even heightened conversation now. I know you had a great conversation about it that I really enjoyed. And I, and I, I like that. I want more conversations. I want more spotlights on the problem. Um, and so in that regard, I was ha- really happy that it came yeah. out. Okay. So let's talk about this idea of fear-based parenting. What does yeah. that look like? Yeah, well, it's one of the the oddest, you know, so societal norms that we've adopted over time is this idea that we we need to make our children feel worse in order to make them be- behave better. And it's <laughs> wait, just, you got to say it, that again. That's actually pretty profound. You got to say that again. Yeah. In like, where did we get the notion that in order to make our children behave better, we must first make them feel worse? And really, you know, for many, many, many years and centuries, it has been the way of doing things, right? If you really want a child to learn their lesson, then there needs to be some type of pain and suffering inflicted. Otherwise, they're just going to think they can do whatever they want, right? And it couldn't be further from the truth. Children are actually brilliant and are incredibly influenced through connection and relationship and firm kindness and strong boundaries. They don't need to be hurt. They don't need to be humiliated. Yes, they need strong boundaries. And um, when you have compassionate, firm and kind discipline set up in your home and you're consistent and you're teaching often and you're holding to those firm boundaries, then it's beautiful. Like they, they learn, they, they make mistakes still because they're human. And then they learn how to make different decisions tomorrow versus just feeling bad about what they did and learning to hide it more or be scared to death of the person they love the most, their parents, um, again, hurting, harming, humiliating them. Uh, so that fear-based parenting style. Again, it makes sense why so many of us got to that place where that was what just all of a sudden we realized we were doing and trying. And then if you have a strong-willed child, then thank God they raise their hand and kind of say like, heck no, this does not work. I won't tolerate this. So what every family really needs is a firm and kind discipline toolkit that combines the relationship with the firm, kind, strong limits in the home. We always say, um, I always tell my students, rules plus relationship equals respect. Rules minus relationship equals rebellion. And so when parents really learn how to enforce those strong limits and have things like logical consequences and uh, natural consequences and really a focus on how to self-regulate first and foremost in their home, that's both modeled and taught, that is what equals a beautiful learning environment for children because they're human. They're going to make mistakes. And what we all want is for our children to learn from their mistakes. We don't need them to feel bad about their mistakes. God has given them this this perfectly designed natural guilt system. Guilt is, whoops, I did something wrong. I wish I wouldn't have done that. I realized that that felt bad in my body after I hit my brother or whatever it may be. Shame is something's wrong with me. What's what it was I thinking? Oh my gosh, I'm a bad kid. Um, you know, my mom thinks I'm 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 mean. Whatever it may be, shame is not what we're going for. It's ineffective. Brene Brown has proven it through her research. Uh, but guilt is a God given natural design, and if you come beside your children and help them learn from their mistakes, they will make different choices tomorrow, as long as you're enabling and teaching them how to make different choices tomorrow versus just stop it and be better. So a lot of emphasis here is around the how to, not just the stop it. And that's what we do when we do compassionate discipline work and really just empower families Mm -hmm. to build up a full toolkit. We have a really funny thing that happened in our house, uh, which kind of speaks to this. Uh, I personally have a son who had to learn empathy. Um, (laughs) Hey, some of them just exist. My husband was the exact same way when he was a kid. They just, people uh, uh, are very fun little science experiments. And it's like, no, no, they actually have feelings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The the theory of mind was a little bit behind with the, 
with this and I love him dearly um but we had this moment where we had been telling him you know uh explaining why you can't push your sister off the couch and why that's not okay and why when she falls she cries and all this stuff and, and just he, for context he is three sorry yes he, he is, is three, three years and old and she's, and she's one, one. And, and this was this was like back in like the winter like back so he mm-hmm. was quite little yeah. Anyway, so we're in his room and he is crying. He says, I am bad. This is a little three-year-old. And Connor just looks at him and says, you are not, my husband just looks, you are not yeah. bad, Alex. You are good. You just did a bad thing. And yes. because you're a good person, you're going to learn how to do good things. And so now he says, when he gets in trouble, but mommy, I am not a bad person. I just do bad things sometimes. <laughs> and it's really cute. And don't we all, we little buddy? Point, don't we all? We've got to the point where like, yeah, but you have to actually try to do the good things. <laughs> that's that's the part that we're at now. But that idea of like understanding, oh, there are bad things to do. There are good things to do. And and uh, mm-hmm. and uh, you're still a good you're still a good person. We still love you. Everything's still okay. You just need to stop doing the bad things. That's, yes, that's but I think a good example though. This is a really good example is I think a lot of parents get into these power struggles with their three, four, five, six year old kids. And then of course into teenagehood, which is a whole other kit and caboodle. But you know, we get into these power struggles with our kids where we're trying to get them to do what we want them to do. Um, And we see it as like, I need to change that behavior. And we can get into really controlling techniques because we don't know what else to do. And we get really scared. Like my kid is going to grow up and be an axe murderer. Well, and I mean, as the person who's in the middle of it, right? Like I'm the one who has the the Mm three-year-old, right? Like even like the last time we talked, Alex was two, right? Like Alex was not even three years old. Last time Wendy and I like really talked on the podcast. Exactly. And so like, I'm in a totally different stage of parenting from then. Like toddler parenting yes. is totally different than like childhood parenting. Mm-hmm. And you kind of start, I'm I'm entering into like the genuine childhood parenting, like that you can actually reason through things. Mm-hmm. What do you yeah. think will happen if you do this or that? Um, and, and it is hard because you're like, no, I actually do just need to end this behavior in, in your head. Like he can't push people. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. she can't bite people. Like right, they yeah. need to stop doing these things. And and I I I I understand the fear there because I mean I've definitely am and I have wonderful, wonderful children who I I I don't ever want to like make it sound like don't, but I'm like my I I've had moments where I'm like, holy cow, what are we doing? Because I think everyone yeah. does when you're a parent. Mm-hmm. you know you and do. it's so easy yeah. to, to think what am I doing I'm doing everything wrong I need to lay down the law instead of just kind of maybe we all just need to take a step back and mm-hmm. stop asking so much of ourselves and like maybe we mm-hmm. stop going to 18 play groups a week for a little bit until we can self right? a little bit better mm-hmm. <laughs> you know yeah. those kinds of things too it's, it's easy to get into this idea of I have to fix this and and that's just what I'm trying to say there. Yeah. And like, yeah, I and, and, and you do have to deal with the behavior, but it's like the way we do that and the way we engage with it really matters mm. because for a lot of people, the way you engage with it is just controlling your kid. Yeah. I'm going to control my kid. I'm going to be really punitive. I'm going to yell, you know, <laughs> I'm going to spank. And we talked a lot about spanking on the last podcast. Um, and so I will put links. We've, so we've covered this a lot on this podcast. So I'll put links to previous podcasts where we talked about spanking. Um, But yeah, we get into these really negative cycles where we're trying to control Mm -hmm. either with spanking or with yelling or whatever. And that doesn't, it's like, what are we actually aiming for though? Because do you want your child to behave externally? So like to do the right thing that they're supposed to do without really it coming from the heart, like doing it out of fear or do you want your child to develop character so that they're doing it because they're choosing to do it? Absolutely. And you know, every single parent on the planet, it's a no-brainer to answer, yes, we want our, our child to do it because they know it's the right thing to do, right? It's like another great question to ask yourself is, um, do you want to control your kids or do you want to teach your kids to control themselves? And it's so simple, right? Like it's so simple when we think about it, but then we fall into these patterns where, 
we are yelling or threatening. Like those are the big things, right? Like most <laughs> people before they invest and really learn and become fluent in these type of connection-based firm and kind strategies, they're just relying on the hand-me-down parenting tactics. Again, it makes total sense, right? Mm -hmm. Like, especially when you see them maybe air quotes work for other people who don't have the strongest willed child on the planet, because the strongest willed child will raise hell about it. Um, mm -hmm. But when you see it air quotes working in the short term and like shiny, happy people, right? People looked at the Duggars and thought, oh, it's working. Mm -hmm. And that was in the short term. That was not actually exposing all the long-term detrimental effects. So it makes sense why we got there and why we rely on these patterns and why we fall into this just vicious cycle of what I call hopeless parenting, because you do these external controls. You think it's working because in the short term, your child might be scared of you enough or scared of the consequence, but long-term whether that's a few days from now, a few months ago, or once they develop, once they grow up to be teenagers and get really good at hiding, lying, and doing stuff behind your back without you finding out, then you realize, dang it, I invested in the wrong strategies and um, I wish I could go back in time, right? And we don't want anyone to get to that place. Mm -hmm. So the biggest thing I want to encourage families with is to remember that when you, when you are able to like completely shift out of a punishment mindset and into a compassionate discipline one, it not only works better uh, to get, teach the, your children the life skills that they need to learn in order to be successful, thriving, wonderful human beings, but it also makes you more sane. It gives you the joy and the peace that you don't have to control these other humans beings, right? Like mm -hmm. I always think like right in the beginning of the Bible, we got right in the beginning is like, we were never meant to control other people. Yes, we were meant to control our environments, but not people. That was never the path. That was never how we were designed. And so we're fighting to, to do this impossible task. And then the strong-willed ones are like, Heck no, they won't even, they won't even, most of them like won't even comply for a minute with the external based stuff. Um, so it, it, beco it becomes joyful when you have discipline in your home and influential tactics where you're actually united as a team and you are doing things where you're teaching children their life skill. That's a big thing that I hear all the time with parents is, um, you know, it's so easy to focus on what you don't want your kid to do and the behavior that you want to stop, which makes sense, right? Like it's a problem, as Rebecca said. And what we really want to do with discipline every day with our children is look at the missing life skill. What are we teaching today? Mm -hmm. What like, you know, when a kid is pushing another kid on the couch, it's usually self-control and self-regulation that is the missing life skill. Mm -hmm. It's the ability yes. to, <laughs> yes, it's Have the ability a to be shred of impulse control. <laughs> yes, exactly. Please. <laughs> but like kinesthetic kids, a lot of strong-willed kids are kinesthetic kids. A lot of kinesthetic kids are strong-willed kids. Yeah. They, yeah. they, they're the ones in target where you walk through and they hear touching everything. Stella was when, when I would take her to, um, uh, gymnastics class, when she was a toddler, she would tackle hug her friends. She couldn't just hug her friends, tackle mm -hmm. hug her friends. Yes. And I would watch from a distance, just mortified my little guy. Who's actually my easygoing guy. He's almost 13. Now he, um, made a really bad mistake when he was three and was on like a play structure and pushed his buddy who was four him I think they were both four like really hurt his wrist bad I was mortified like oh my gosh that's a whole story for another day beautiful story of compassionate discipline but I almost lost my mind for those three days I sent him to grandma's house for three days you guys because I was flipping out I'm like oh, am I drinking Kool-Aid this isn't working but long story short this wasn't a bad kid he wasn't he was never even the kid that did things out of anger like my daughter does like I do mm -hmm. he was just excited he just mm -hmm. didn't have the self-control when you're playing tag and you have another like he just pushed a kid because he didn't have self-regulation and self-control and hadn't learned the life skill that you don't push kids from up high yet or he hadn't strengthened it to the ability of fluency yet right and so after that now, now think, about, think about that situation though and what if in that situation you yell at that child and you make them think terrible things about themselves right yeah. instead of coming alongside them and saying okay we're gonna make sure he's all right yeah. Like, obviously you need to deal with exactly. the child is hurt and, and in the story that you shared in the workshop, and I'm sure you'll share it in the workshop coming up too. like, you know, you, you, you've come up with strategies of, of how to do that. But the point is you don't want your child to label themselves as bad. You just want to take this and say, okay, yeah. How can we learn regulation? You know, the kinesthetic thing, Alex, your son, 
is so like this. Oh and my gosh. Yes. And we ended up um going to the Y where they have this amazing room where everything there's like I don't even know how to it's, describe it's an it. Essence, it's, just, it's a padded room for toddlers. But it's really cute. Like, it's like, like a McDonald's play place, floors. but everything is padded. And and you can bang off stuff. And it's just, it was wonderful yes. for him because he just was... needed to bang off stuff. He, he really did. But, people. <laughs> yeah. And then we and then we got to learn not to bang people off of the stuff. And but oh, I, yes. I loved how you talk about the idea of thinking about what life lessons do you actually want your kids to learn and what skills do you want them to learn? Because I think what we often forget is that with the punitive controlling parenting we're also teaching our children life skills and we're teaching them lessons Mm -hmm. because we're teaching them about how they should relate to other people Mm -hmm. like we think about how does someone be like and and I I know this is hard to talk about these are kinds of things I think about as someone who also has a very strong-willed kid and as myself being very strong-willed is what are we teaching our children about how they will relate to future partners are we teaching them control are we teaching them to be nitpick and to scream out people's flaws and to beat them down and break them down emotionally until they do what we want them to do? Or are we teaching them how to like connect, take ownership and stand up and have boundaries? Are we teaching them that it's acceptable when people berate you and people convince you that you're a horrible, horrible person because you made a mistake? Like, what are we priming our children to end up with people who will try to control them because that feels familiar? Are we already doing half the work for a bad relationship before they're even age five? Like Mm -hmm. these are questions I do think we have to be willing to ask us. And we need to realize that a lot of these punitive parenting techniques are, are highly correlated with future abusive relationships. And it really are. It it, it is quite scary. Yeah. And I, and I, I think that when I saw, sorry, I saw this amazing, uh, TikTok is this is which we've been talking a lot about punitive and on the other side I saw this fantastic TikTok from a guy a dad who does a lot of gentle parenting content that's like the no nonsense gentle parenting kind of situation where he said listen if you sound like you're in a hostage negotiation setting you're not a gentle parent you're a permissive one like it's okay honey it's okay it's okay it's okay I'll make the chicken nuggets I'll make the chicken it's, I know you don't like lasagna okay. do you want peanut butter jelly do you want chicken nuggets do you what what do you want it's, it's okay just don't cry don't cry it's okay don't yell I'll give you like, a cookie just put on your shoes yeah. you don't have to put up your toys you don't have to clean up your toys it's okay I know you're tired I know this isn't a good day for you you don't have to clean up your toys it's okay mom you'll just do it it's okay it's okay stop like that's not that's not gentle parenting either and i think when we when we're used to controlling our kids we think that we do the opposite our kids control us right so right. what mom says goes oh that's not okay okay well then it must be so what the kid says goes and really what it is is setting up standards of behavior and standards of expectation and in essence your own kind of familial moral code that also is in line with what society like requires from us Mm -hmm. and holding everyone in the family accountable Mm -hmm. right like we had a moment where uh there was there was a, a a danger there was a a an issue with our dog being in a lot of danger because he has five pounds and I have two toddlers and he's blind and he's blind (laughs) and it's just he's in essence a furry Roomba vacuum at this point who likes to hang out under my children's feet it is not a good situation for anyone at this point and there was a point where Alex was doing something really unsafe and he was about to land on the dog it was going to be end of Winston um (laughs) it was not going to be a good end either so I whipped that kid in midair off the couch and like and he bonked when he came down didn't get serious here because I was still holding on to him but it was it was scary because it was fast and I had to react in a minute right and he is crying and Winston's barking and Vivian's (laughs) clapping and there's just a lot going on and he and I had this conversation where I I explained to him what he had been doing wrong. We have a very strict no jumping on the couch when Winston is on the couch rule, right? Because Winston nice. could die. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and we Simple explained child. that you could, you could actually really hurt or kill Winston. And we explained it very yeah. very bluntly to him. And and he and and then I he 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 actually apologized for that. And he's like, I need to calm down. It's like yes, we need to calm down. And then I said, and also, mummy did not mean to hurt you, but I know I hurt you, and I know I scared you, and I'm very sorry. Right. And, and it's, it's those both things. It's like, we have to have the standard where it was the right thing to do to whip him off the couch. Mm-hmm. It was. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the dog is still living. Barely. <laughs> he's very old. I'm not sure how much time we save, but it was, it, he's, he's still with us. Right. Alex is not traumatized with guilt. 
You know, no. it was the right choice. But it's this idea that we have standards that everyone in the family is held to. Alex has to apologize to me if he accidentally hurts me. I apologize to Alex if I accidentally hurt him. I also don't jump on the dog, right? Like there. Yeah, are exactly. Some, I love that little dog so much. Oh my yeah. Um, yeah. No, but these, the I think that's that's what often we get confused about. It's not that like what parents say go, and so therefore what children say go. It's that no. It's that what we are supposed to do is what we do. And we yeah. all have to do that. Yeah. And what, I want to riff on two things because gosh, you just shared so many beautiful things. Um, but but just looking at the long-term effects, right? Like we're not trying to scare anybody into changing their ways, right? And I always like now that I'm at the point of my career as an educator, having the 16 year old who we've been doing this work with her since she's three, seeing the difference with how she operates and is in the world. Like it's so much of your book, uh, Rebecca, and she's not perfect, right? She has hiccups here and there, but it's just so beautiful to see the difference. But then I see everything from like a very drone point of view, right? So I can zoom out and just kind of see, and I'm always looking at things from like a very curious lens, but I see it all over the place. The long-term effects of the kids who the shaming and the hurting and the humiliating and the overpowering was used on them, again, especially with the strong kids. Just this last few days, I'm helping a good friend um, with a marriage that is really, uh, it's not looking good. And, uh, you know, he's coming to the table realizing for the last four years um, how he's contributed so much. And we've watched and the amount of like criticism, overpowering, irritation, annoyance, frustration, and just like hostility you could feel from his end. And then come to find out like his family used all the punitive things, right? Like he was the hard kid. Um, he was spanked. He was all always in timeout. Um, been a long time, long, long, long time family friend since like birth. And I just see it so clearly. Like when you have a child who has such a strong need to feel powerful and is never given the opportunity to learn how to feel powerful in a healthy way, and then also is overpowered in many, many different ways and hurt and harmed and humiliated, they often grow up to have very un healthy coping skills and very unhealthy ways of feeling powerful. So that comes out in passive aggressiveness, that comes out in criticizing others, that comes out in the ability to not have and be able to do peaceful conflict resolution in a marriage. And that's just the marriage example. Um, but I do see the long-term effects very, very clearly. And again, I see it so much in my daughter's age group now that she's almost 16. So it really is a big deal when you, I know it's like, we're, we're all in the moment and we're just like, we just want our kids to put on their shoes and not jump on the dog but what you're doing <laughs> yeah it's like and what you're doing when you invest to learn a different way of influencing and teaching your children life lessons is literally setting them up for success and to thrive as a human being the rest of their life so just know that and then second is yes the strong boundaries we I always say with little kids especially more action less words and, you know, you mentioned like the idea of like a lot of people think that positive parenting is permissive because we're not doing the heavy handed stuff, right? We're not hitting, harming, humiliating the kids. And we are not perfect by any means. There are moments where we may still hit, harm and humiliate our kids, but th that's not the, that's not the goal. That's not what well, we're not reading a book and saying, that sounds smart. I'm going to go for that. Like, mm -hmm. yes, we mess up. There are hiccups. Our group inside of our program is filled with people who come in and are like, dang it. I did it again, right? Like help me make a different decision tomorrow or I slipped into hand-me-down parenting tactics or my knee-jerk reaction, but that is not the goal and that's not how we try to live. But um, more action, less words. And again, it's the farthest thing from permissiveness. And it reminded me, Rebecca, your story of the couch is we were in Ireland on um, top of the cliffs of mower. I don't know if you know these, mm -hmm. but they're like death, like literally just two days before there was like a tourist who died. Like, and we were there with our kids. We went to see an, a concert at a castle in Ireland. It was one of the best trips of our lives. And we were visiting the cliffs of Mower with our kids. So my little guy, I think it was eight at the time. And he started to get close to that cliff. And man, I was like, I grabbed him by the shirt and like slammed him down we were taking a picture and it was so instinctual and firm <laughs> but yet uh, like he was so upset about it and we have this funny picture where like he's so mad <laughs> and um and it was not with an intention to hurt him and it was really firm and mm -hmm. it was like 
heck no. Arm. There yeah, is the mom no arm. negotiation here. There is no permissiveness. So it's just an example, right? Like more action, less words. And sometimes, you know, there is like, a, there's a high level of firmness in positive parenting, whatever you want to call it, connection-based, um, positive parenting, um, you know. Authoritative. I have a lot of good friends in the, that are like in the gentle Christian parenting world, but whatever it is, it's like, it is so much firmness. I actually spend a lot of my time teaching parents how to be more firm, Mm -hmm. and yeah that's how to not hurt their children because I think a lot of people think they're firm when they yell Mm -hmm. but actually people can be very permissive parents who just yell a lot it's so true Sheila it is yelling has no consequence well I mean and why didn't rebel right that was one of one of my interviewees said yeah we just figured out that all mom and dad ever did was yell at us who are like is this worth getting yelled at and if the answer was yeah we just did it (laughs) and then they just get yelled at and they're like okay so I snuck out Okay, I think that's about a 25 minute yell and then awkwardness for two days. Yeah, it's worth it. Let's go. <laughs> it's true. It's true. There's usually not a logical consequence associated with yelling. There's just shame and intimidation. Mm-hmm. Like I have, it took so it took me seven years to stop yelling. I've been doing this work now for 13. It took me a long time. I grew up in a yelling home, but I remember I yelled so bad one time at my little guy who was gosh, he must've been like, maybe he was five at the time because he poured out a huge thing of organic bubble bath, you know, like world ending oh. stuff. I yelled so hard at him in his face that he just started bawling. Like if you're listening, if you've ever yelled so hard that you made your child cry, I still love you. I've been there. <laughs> like it happens, but heck no, that's not the way I want to live my life. My body was on fire. My nervous system was on like freaking out. His nervous system was freaking out. We were both in our amygdala. That is not the tool that I want to use to influence my children to not pour out bubble bath tomorrow. So Mm -hmm. it's, again, it's just a knee jerk reaction. And so much of it is rooted in this cultural conditioning that you should be able to control your children. And it's just not, it's just not true. Right. But like when as happy, shiny people pointed out, yes, that is actually possible when you have that level of fear and intimidation and overpowering in these super twisted and toxic ways, you can actually control human beings. And so that made just society so confused the impact of that movement and everything and there's that's it wasn't new right like that's been going on for centuries i'm reading a apartheid book right now right like it's it's nothing new um but at the same time like that is not how we want to influence our children and so in the end it just becomes a choice and it becomes undoing the cultural conditioning like our brains have these very thick neural pathways and once we do it for a while and we start to romanticize it thinking that it's getting us the results that we want then the neural pathway is paved and it becomes this what feels like a very easy path which is what a knee-jerk reaction is and so to undo that takes courage and practice and tenacity and also being beside people who can show you like hey look at all the ways you can actually influence your kids to not run in the street or touch a hot stove or jump on the dog in different ways and look, it works. Here's a story. Here's a story. Here's a story. Here's how different I feel when I go to bed at night and I haven't made my child cry because I made him feel so bad about himself or or made him so scared that I was going to hurt him, right? Like this is how it feels inside my body and it feels amazing. Like all of that will help you undo that neural pathway and learn a different way. And it takes courage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking about what you said about the amygdala when you're both in that amygdala space. Like, I don't, I think that's what often people don't understand is like when we are using threat, spanking, punishments, then you almost create like a fight flight response in your kid and you're there too, right? Yeah. <laughs> you're in the fight. And so when you're in that space, you're not using your rational brain. And so your child isn't learning you know, this is how I can self-regulate. This is how I can control my behavior. They're just learning. I need to make this stop. And that's, that's a very different lesson. Yeah. It's like the difference if your kid spills something or like makes a huge mess, like screaming at them over top of the spill versus like, you know, getting very quiet and being like, you made a mess. It's time to clean this up and handing him the cloth and the cleaning spray. That's often a lot more uncomfortable for the child Mm -hmm. right like I know like yeah 
and then act because they actually have to sit there and clean up what they did Mm -hmm. and they're like well I don't want it they scream okay you just sit there until they clean it up it's like we're here until we clean this up Mm -hmm. you're here it's like doesn't matter you you can scream for 25 minutes that's fine I can sit for longer like it's it's this idea and how and what did you learn from the mistake and like how are you going to do it differently tomorrow so we don't so we can be outside playing right now instead of sitting on the floor cleaning up milk with an old dirty rag, right? Like it's just, exactly. what did you learn? How are we going to do it differently tomorrow? All while looking inside of ourselves and going, huh, that's interesting. I have such a huge temptation to smack or yell right now, right? Like it's just all part of this like crazy mm-hmm. journey that we do as parents as we're yeah. unlearning so much of this stuff. Yeah, I think like as, you know, as parents too, I remember- it wasn't that I wanted to yell. It wasn't that I wanted to be punitive. It's just sometimes you really, you don't know what to do. And I think the biggest problem for me was actually when the kids were older. It wasn't when they I were I know toddlers. exactly what you're going for. Oh, by the way. Yeah. And Katie is editing this currently. <laughs> so I'm sure that she's yeah, also they, laughing. You're going like, for chores, right? Yeah, yeah, it was awful. Like the oh, years yeah. where they were between like nine and 13. nine and thirteen, and it was especially <laughs> bad. Yeah, it was especially bad when Rebecca had already gone through puberty, and my younger daughter hadn't. Yeah. And Katie was feeling like I'm losing my big sister because Rebecca wanted to be, you know, big and not a little. Girl I literally anymore. made a made a, a sign for my door only Rebecca's space. Katie, go away! <laughs> yeah. I yeah. literally made a sign. And- and then if I, if I assigned them Saturday chores, you know, Rebecca would just follow Katie around and tell me all the things that Katie was doing wrong and say, Katie's yeah. complaining. <laughs> and it was just like, and I would just lose my mind yes. <laughs> because the whole time that Katie was being silly, cause she was like, she was horrible doing chores. <laughs> doing hers either because she was yeah. following her sister around trying to boss her around and it was it was so frustrating and you know and this is when we often lose it um and when especially when we don't have the other strategies and um you know that's what I really appreciate and you are doing this this webinar we're going to have the link uh in the podcast notes but is fresh start family um, families online.com it, so the registration link, I know you're going to put it in the thing, but it's freshstartfamilyonline.com forward slash bare marriage. Okay. It's Fresh Start Family Online. Yep. Fresh Start Family Online.com forward slash bare marriage. And so, I want to yeah. add to what you just shared here in a second, because I want us to share about something. Yeah, but I just want to say, so if you want to know, like, okay, I don't want to yell. I don't want to get in these power struggles, but I literally don't know what else to do. <laughs> yeah. Like at least the yelling makes the kids move their butt. Yeah. Right. Like, or it yeah. does, it does something, but like, I literally don't know what else to do you know that's what that's what you're going to share with us but what would you say to me if it was me 17 17 years years ago ago. or something yeah math is hard math is hard I love it well yes just that workshop is going to be awesome you guys yeah we'll we'll talk a little bit about yelling but like when you have a a compassion discipline toolkit that you're like oh yeah this is strong I can rely on this day in and day out to teach the kids important life lessons after they've made a mistake, your like thinking, your thought process that you have to yell will subside. So even though in the workshop, it's not necessarily like, how do you stop yelling workshop? We're going to talk about like, how do you build out a compassionate discipline toolkit? So you have choices that are strong, firm, connected, relatable, reasonable, like all the things. It's going to be amazing. Um, And it will help you yell less. But with the yelling and like, I can so connect with you, Sheila, because my gosh, right now with kids that are almost 13 and 16, chores are the biggest thing right now where I am, you know, I'm at least, I told you, it took me seven years to stop yelling. I'm, but I still, I'm like, I'll get very firm and still, why are you yelling at me? And I'm like, I am not yelling, you know? And it's like, yes, I am. Right. I'm still having those moments moments where it's like, I'm heightened, obviously. But the thing when we get so heightened, and a lot of times yelling is a result of us engaging in a fru- a tone of frustration. The tone of frustration is basically one that we entertain this thought loop of I've tried everything and yes. nothing works. I've tried, you know, I was just in two situations this week. I taught a workshop of 30 teachers. They were amazing. But one set of teachers were so thick in the frustration loop that they could not even think for, they could not access their creative brain at all because they were so busy justifying how much they've tried and how much they've done in order to get this one strong-willed kid 
to do what he was supposed to do in the kindergarten class last year, that we just kept going through the same loop of frustration. And so frustration is a great one to realize that you're caught in that and it'll just drive you insane. And it'll keep justifying why you have to keep yelling because you think that nothing else is going to work. And again, that's going to keep you out of the creativeness. And in order to be effective as a parent and to come up with creative solutions on how am I going to get Katie and Rebecca to like leave each other alone, like <laughs> clean up their stuff, whatever it may be, you have to be creative. You have to be from a, coming from a place of like, hey, how am I going to make them have empathy for one another? How am I going to help them have peaceful conflict resolution? How am I going to set the firm boundary here? How am I going to give choices to empower? Like all this stuff we're going to go over in the workshop. But um, and then also, how am I going to implement some logical consequences, right? Like if if the chores don't get done and they want to go out to like a movie on Friday night, like what is what is the logical consequence there? Like we're going to plan it. We're going to do it. Um, but really, if you're not in your creative brain, if you're in your amygdala, which is like panicking, you're like, these girls are going to grow up to be entitled brats who think they can boss their husbands around because they never like they're so entitled. They're just like that fear brain will suck the life out of you as a parent. And, and then you just end up being caught in this loop. So the creativity is really important. And when you're in that frontal lobe of like, you're seeing things for what they clearly are, you have two tween kids who are learning the life skill of being a contributing member of the family and also how to be in a sisterly relationship and want their own space and still get along, right? Like it's a tale you know, as old as time. Cause, Cause now looking back, on it, I can think of so many ways I could have handled those things differently. Like right, one of you're in your creative things, brain now. One of the big things I would have done was have them simply do chores at different times or different there rooms you go. in I different rooms. Mm -hmm. Like it would it would have just because the big problem was that she <laughs> Rebecca would just follow her sister <laughs> around to notice all the things that Katie did badly. And one of my biggest things was Rebecca, that's my job, that's not yours. And so just literally And I was like, but you're not doing it. You're letting yeah. her do it wrong. You're not yeah. doing your I job. I do it better, Mom. Yeah. yeah. And so like just taking Rebecca out of that situation <laughs> and letting Katie do it. And then if it was wrong, I could deal with it. But I felt like I couldn't deal with it because Rebecca was telling me, you know, so that was bad. So and, I couldn't have them do yeah. it differently. I could have or at different times, I could have really worked on on, you know, Katie was feeling badly because Becca didn't, she felt like Becca was leaving her behind, you know? And so what could we have done to help Katie feel like she was still loved? And also what could we do to give Rebecca a chance to experience more independence without her little sister? Right. I love it. And those were the two things that were really in conflict then is Rebecca wanted to feel older because she was, but she often still had the same bedtime. They still were like, they still were being treated very similarly. So like, yeah. how could I have given Rebecca more responsibility while also giving, Rebecca looking at me like, no, I think you should have. Have. <laughs> yeah, but, which is empowerment. But like you know, the whole reason you're able to like come up with those things is because now you're able to see it from like a creative way, right? Like you're, yeah. and you're also detached. I think in those moments when we're yelling, we're also buying into this idea that like, we have to appear like we know what to do. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's the first time we've ever had tweens that are fighting at nine and 13 or me. It's the first time I've ever had a 13 and a 16 year old who bicker a lot and aren't necessarily always doing their chores. Like we got to give ourselves grace, but the, the, the yelling is often a cover up to make mm -hmm. us appear like we are powerful and we know what to do at the exact same time we are claiming we're powerless and it's just a facade that doesn't solve the problem. And so if we can come to the table and just give ourselves some space and be like, huh, I don't know what to do here. Mm -hmm. And so instead of like acting like I do by puffing up and intimidating someone and thinking that's going to work to like teach these girls the life skills that they want, I'm going to slow down, give myself some space, put everyone to bed maybe a little bit early tonight and really think about it from a detached place. What could I do tomorrow what are my options? This doesn't mean I'm a bad parent, right? That's another whole aspect of it is it's when we start to think we we should know what to do, like we should know how to make these children listen. And the fact that they're not means that we're a bad parent. Like it all just starts spiraling into this, like we lose our cool, we flip our lid and then we just keep driving ourselves crazy. And we you want know, to get out of that. And I think the other thing is like to enter into your children's emotional state. Cause I didn't do that enough. You know, I thought mm. I know my kids, 
but I knew how I wanted them to behave. And I was so focused on that, that I missed what they each were feeling. And they each had some very valid emotions that I didn't deal right. with very well. Like, yeah, Katie was feeling left behind, but Rebecca was feeling like Katie's getting away with too many things. And so she, exactly. she's like smirking now. So, so she was held to a much higher standard and that that wasn't fair. But one of the reasons, of course, she was, was older. I was, I, she, she was supposed was to be older. held to a higher standard. She was older, but also I felt like I couldn't come down hard on Katie because Becca always was and I didn't want to positively reinforce Becca coming down hard on Katie. You're so explaining like, my I, household right now. Exactly. I was missing like. out on both of their emotional states and I was trying to impose this is what you guys need to do. Whereas if I had just like understood where they were emotionally and entered into that, you know, that probably would have done a lot too. And it, and that's a skill that's hard. Well, I had a moment which might be a bad parenting moment. I don't know, <laughs> but it worked. <laughs> where yeah. alexander again alexander's three years old every three-year-old is like this at some point but he's just and he's a kinesthetic kid he's a big body play kid and for people who don't know like picture in your mind my 90th percentile three-year-old well now he's not nine, but he's a big kid he's a big truck of a kid and my slightly growth restricted 10th percentile daughter who's two years younger than him yes rough oh. playing <laughs> formula for losing your mind um so alexander plays with vivian the way that he wants people to play with him right yeah, he will yeah. body slam her into the couch mm -hmm. and she loves it until she does it right and yeah. he will push her and he'll he'll whip her around at one point he literally whipped her around by her neck it was terrifying and there was yeah. a day of like time after time you hear bonk cry bonk cry right mm -hmm. for like hours yeah. and i brought him upstairs and I was trying to talk to him about it, but like, you cannot do this. He was just laughing and giggling because he's all amped up and he's having a fun time with his sister. And I just started crying. Yes. And he just looked at me and like, it was like, what's going on? <laughs> right? Like, what's going on? And I was just crying. And I said, you just can't hurt your sister anymore. I said, I can't watch you hurt your sister. You are very big and strong. And that is a good thing but you cannot hurt your sister. And it makes mommy really, really sad. And it also makes mommy scared that you're going to hurt Vivian. And he, and I just told him, I was like, I don't know. Maybe you'll still feel too guilty. Maybe he's too young. I was like, I don't know. I'm at no, the end of it. It's I'm not guilt at all. How I feel. That's called vulnerability. Yes, exactly. That's called vulnerability but, but the and way, connection. And he just looks at me and he says, it's okay, mommy. You are frustrated. And he gives me a hug. Beautiful. <laughs> and we talked yes. about it. And he just said, I will not hurt Vivian. And for his <laughs> for the record, he Beautiful. tried really hard for the rest of the day, which when you're three is a win. <laughs> when you're yes. three. And he's doing a lot better now. He also has yeah. learned that when he hits he he has actually had a moment where he hit Vivian and um he looks at me and he immediately knows he's like, I need to calm down. And he goes and he sits on the stair nice. and he calms down and he says, I think I am ready to be kind now. <laughs> Yes, but it's oh. like a year. <laughs> you know, that's, that's that's I think where 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 we're at is like how is is that's what the workshop's going to be talking about is like I'm not a perfect parent. I don't know what I'm doing either. Um, but the idea yep. of like what do you do and how do you accept that although the quote unquote the old ways bite work faster in the interim, long term they don't pay off, mm -hmm. and how can you feel confident in what you're doing, knowing that it's probably going to take a lot longer to pay off than your friends who are willing to really harshly punish kids into compliance because like, yeah. teaching just takes a lot more time than controlling. So that's what we're going to be talking about in the mm -hmm. webinar. And it's free. We are. I just said at the beginning, it is free. Um, and it's you, even if you can't make it live, mm -hmm. you can sign up and then you can watch the recording. Um, but if you can make it live, it's super fun and you can ask questions and things like that. So please um, check it out. Freshstartfamilyonline.com um, yes. slash, slash bear marriage. Bear marriage. Yeah. And the yes. And I'm going to have, podcasting. I'm going to do a few giveaways for those who are there live, Sheila. So that'll be really fun. So yes, you will, we'll always have the replay available, but there will be huge, um, a huge perk to being there live. Again, we'll do Q and A at the end. We'll do a few fun giveaways. And yeah, you guys, those kinesthetic kids, they make a lot of mistakes. The strong willed kids, they learn through doing, but Stella was the same exact way, Rebecca. And she grew up, we started her with drumming at kindergarten. She is now um, just like, 
I'm, I'm our mom, so I'm going to sound silly, but it's, it's like she's a professional drummer. She's almost 16 and she can, I mean, her drumming skills are amazing, but she needed to hit something hard from a young age. And she's a like a really high level beach volleyball athlete, really wants to get a scholarship. I think she's probably going to pull it off in the next year or two, but it's just, those are a result of her kinesthetic body, right? And so hang in there. And yes, we will teach those actionable steps. Like if we need a child to have more self-regulation and be able to be next to a sister and have that self-control and have a different outlet for being getting those kinesthetic needs met how do we teach that through compassionate discipline especially mm -hmm. after they've made a mistake again we're going to cover all the theory but we're going to give you guys the actionable steps that you can apply immediately and see like magnificent results in your home yeah. and that is september 14th it is at 10 o'clock pacific a.m so one o'clock eastern one o'clock p.m eastern um, yep. live, but you can watch the recording and you can sign up for that. You know, I think too, when I think about why this is so important to me, I think it's because the way that our children experience us as parents and the way that we act as parents says a lot, but what we think God is like. Mm, yes. And, you know, when you're constantly yelling at your kids because you're trying to control them because you're really afraid that they're going to be bad. I wonder how many of us think that's what God thinks of us, you know, it's so that, true that God is trying to, that God wants to control us, that God wants to punish us, that God is upset at us, that God thinks that we embarrass him, that we're not good enough. Um, and what would it be if, if we could see a, a different picture of God? And one of the best quotes that I've read in a book lately is that, when you, when you think of Jesus, a lot of us, like, you know, a lot of us know that, that, that in Jesus, we can see what God is like, mm -hmm. but what if we flip that on its head and realize that it isn't just that Jesus is like God, it's that God is like Jesus and Jesus yeah. doesn't try to control us and punish us and shame us. You know, Jesus laughed with people and engaged with people and really and answered people in different ways, depending mm -hmm. on their needs and where they were coming from and just wanted to help people grow in the right direction. And he was creative about it and he did it in all different ways, but he was really looking at, at changing the heart. Um, yeah. And he did that through love and acceptance, but also firmness right? He was in relationship, right? And relationship. Like that relationship, man, yeah. that relationship part. Yeah. And that's God. That's God. That's how he sees us. That's what he wants to be with us. And if we can accept that God is like that, that's really freeing. And then wouldn't it be wonderful if we could give our kids that vision of God too? And I think that's what happens when we leave punitive parenting behind. We also leave permissive parenting behind because it isn't just about letting your kid run everything, no. <laughs> you know, <Nope. clears throat> um, and instead, yeah, we, we do this compassionate discipline with firm kindness. So I love that. So I hope that people can come September 14th, one o'clock Eastern, 10 o'clock Pacific, um, and, and join us at freshstartfamilyonline.com slash bear marriage. So thank I you. I love Wendy. it. <laughs> yes, Sheila. And one last thing, it's like so many people when they do that, exactly like you said, they go on that journey. It's like a lot of times when you when you make a go at providing this for your children and making this your reality as you're raising your little human souls, a lot of times it's so healing for people who never had that in their home when they were growing up, right? Like they never had that um, presentation of who God is um, and who wants to be in their life. And now they get to do that for their children. And I just see so many people have deep, profound healing through providing that with their children and something happens within them too. And it's just a beautiful process. So yes, September 14th is gonna be so good. And I just can't wait to hang out with you and spend the hour together, just pouring into your community. I love your community so much. And uh, it's gonna be a really, really good day. All right, well, thanks Wendy. As always, thank you for being here. Wendy is pretty much the reason that I parent that I do for every 
area that I don't get my direct examples from you and dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So all the areas that dad and I messed up in, Wendy has made or things just, better. <laughs> I mean, for people like you did not have a hyperactive young yes, kid, right? Yes, like neither yes. Katie nor I were particularly hyperactive in the way that my son is. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, so my parenting style is just Sheila, Keith, and Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we just, we find her so relatable and really yeah. down to earth. And I know that people have been in her coaching groups and just find her really accessible and kind. Um, yes. But also just so creative with all kinds of ideas. And so we encourage you to check out that free webinar. The link again is in the podcast notes. So thank you for joining us for this edition of the Bear Marriage Podcast. We have so much coming for you in September. Um, we're debunking some stats about whether complementarians do better. Um, we have another one she downloaded for women only coming. Um, We have some fun conversations about the impact of purity culture. So much coming. So um, yeah, always, always wonderful to have you all listen. And just remember that you can help us so much by leaving a rating and a review of this podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts, it helps other people find us and see us so that we don't become an echo chamber, but so that other people who maybe aren't in such great spaces can hear about this too, and can Mm -hmm. hear what health looks like in Jesus. Uh, So go leave that rating and review, and we will see you again next week on the Bear Marriage Podcast. (laughs) Bye-bye.